for a thermal phenomenon? It's pretty strange. In order to detect the internal ramp, the pyramid would have to be scanned. The different densities inside it would need to be measured. This would provide physical and therefore undeniable scientific proof of the ramp's existence. Actually, a similar study was already done in 1986. Back at the time, a team of French engineers analyzed the Khufu pyramid using a technique called microgravimetry. This method allows us to see minor variations in mass and density. In fact, it involves detecting what scientists call zones of significant subdensity, in other words, empty spaces. For months, the technicians took thousands of measurements both inside and outside the pyramid. The team wasn't interested in figuring out how it was built. They were hoping to find a secret chamber. In this respect, their mission was a total failure. Scientific publications of their study went completely unnoticed. Yet, without realizing it, these engineers may have found the scientific proof that Jean-Pierre Houdin has been looking for for so many years. Jean-Pierre contacted one of the scientists who worked on the mission. Huy Dongbui is a member of the French Science Academy and École Polytechnique, France's equivalent of MIT. We found that the sub-density, the density deficits, formed something that was like a spiral. A spiral shape? Exactly. A spiral shape, but in sub-density? Right, in sub-density. The white and green show the subdensity zones. Subdensity? It was drawn by hand. My colleague did it. We really see the spiral. We see the spiral, the subdensity zone, in white. The microgravimetric study shows that in relation to the pyramid's volume, 15% of its mass is missing. The empty spaces inside the monument seem to form a spiral. Back in 1986, Hui Dongbui and his colleagues didn't know what to make of this startling discovery. Now, in light of Jean-Pierre Houdin's theory of the internal ramp, the study makes sense. Microgravimetry offers the scientific proof the architect needed. This irrefutable element convinces Jean-Pierre to devote his life to solving the mystery of how the Great Pyramid of Khufu was built. Jean-Pierre Houdin is now firmly convinced that the internal ramp is definitely there, just a few meters behind these blocks of stone. But he's now looking for more proof that the ramp really exists. If we continue along the phantom lines we'd seen before, we come to something that absolutely fascinates him. According to his calculations, this hole, located at the northeast angle of the pyramid, lies directly on the path of the internal ramp. Would this be what remains from one of the notches that allowed the Egyptians to turn the stone blocks? They'll need to take a closer look. But climbing the pyramid is prohibited. It's dangerous, and many tourists have already suffered accidents. Look at the shape of this notch. Okay. The pavement. Okay. The walls. Yes. You take plenty of pictures. Plenty of pictures. Okay and come back safe. It's a deal. Okay. okay, take care. That being said, the Egyptian authorities are willing to make an exception for certain Egyptologists. Along with a cameraman who's an excellent mountain climber, Bob Breyer is going to check out what the notch looks like up close.
getting there. Slowly but surely, we're getting there. It was really dark. Bob wasn't expecting this dark space. He hasn't even brought a flashlight powerful enough to light it. Hmm. I think this is interesting. It's not the internal rant, but it's still very interesting. Why is the space so big? Photos. Photos for Jean-Pierre. The space wasn't carved out from the stone. It visibly dates back to the pyramid's construction. There's no description of it in any Egyptological book. Up till now, no one has ever investigated this architectural curiosity. Could the existence of this unanticipated room be further evidence of an internal ramp, one that's still there? Well, let me see if I feel any air coming out. No, it's not like a breeze or anything like that, so I don't know how far it goes. It's not exactly an internal ramp, but it's a big space. I think Jean-Pierre will be interested. Uh, I really don't know what it's for. Maybe it's just an accident to construction. Maybe it's not. He'll know better than me. Whew. Better. Back at the hotel, Jean-Pierre studies Bob's photos. Then he checks the plans of the pyramid to see whether there's any drawing or description of the empty space behind the notch anywhere. Even if he knows there isn't. He's sorry he couldn't see it for himself. Jean-Pierre feels he is so close and yet still so far from solving the mystery. However, Jean-Pierre does have a certain number of elements to confirm his theory. The casing stones were definitely placed first. This rules out the possibility of an external spiral ramp, since there's no way it could have been attached to the smooth surface. The Temple of Nuzerere proves that the ancient Egyptians knew how to build an internal ramp. The phantom lines, with their 7% slope, are definitely intriguing. The microgravimetric results offer undeniable proof that empty spaces in the spiral form, like his ramp, actually exist within the pyramid. And finally, there's this hollow space Bob discovered behind the notch. Although all these elements are convincing, another enigma remains at the very heart of the pyramid, the King's Chamber. The theory of the internal ramp works very well for moving limestone blocks that weigh about two tons on average. But how did the ancient workers manage to haul up the granite stones that were so much heavier? This is the most remarkable aspect of the investigation and the most complex to figure out. The one part I'm really not sure about that, that really is the, is the Grand Gallery. This idea that the Grand Gallery was somehow used to raise the blocks to the very top. It's interesting. It's the most interesting explanation of the Grand Gallery anybody's ever come up with. But I'm really not sure. The external ramp that Jean-Pierre imagines isn't enough to explain how the huge granite blocks were moved into the heart of the pyramid. On a ramp with a 7% incline, you'd need 600 men to haul a 60-ton block, but coordinating so many men would be an impossible task. Jean-Pierre thinks the key to the mystery is the Grand Gallery itself. He's convinced the gallery was the key element of a gigantic system of counterweights that would have made it possible for just 100 men to move the enormous granite blocks.
The Grand Gallery is truly an impressive structure. Eight meters high, 48 meters long, and a 50% rate of incline, it has fascinated everyone who's ever entered it. The layout makes no sense from a ceremonial point of view. Could it have been built for practical reasons? If Jean-Pierre's hunch turns out to be right, it'll be a total revolution for Egyptology. The stakes are high, so Bob has some very specific questions for the architect. Jean-Pierre, yes. you are the man with the theory. Yes. You've got a lot of things to explain. First, what are these benches? On this bench, you had rollers. Are these logs? Logs, okay. yes. Okay, yes, go ahead. And these logs, on these logs, yes. you have a trolley. Yes. For the counterweight system. Okay, so the trolley runs up and down on logs, which are across the two benches. Across the two benches. Okay, now I got another question. There are like 28 of these slots. They're important, obviously. It's the first thing you see. What's going on? In these slots, you had wooden beams. Yes. What are they doing? Holding the rollers, keeping the rollers. So these straight. rollers are like logs going on a bench. You got the trolley on top of it, and you got beams in here making sure the logs don't go wild. Jean Pierre, I understand the rollers rolling, the weights are sliding, but is there any evidence that this room was actually used? I think if you have a closer look to the bench on the vertical fence, yeah. we will find some grease, some scratch left by the roller stripe. Oh, this thing that looks like a racing stripe on a car? Yes, look, look right, yeah, right it's there. Clear. Yes, it's clear. Yes, it's a brown it's stripe going down. That, that's grease, you think? It's uh, all along uh -huh. the bench. Yes, yes, yes. It's the same mark. So the trolley, when it goes up and down, they had to lubricate it. They put grease. Yes. And then by going up and down, it scratches. And sometimes uh, the trolley was uh, shaking a bit. Shaking a bit. Uh -huh. Just a small yep. stone and the scratch. No, pretty good. It looks like it was used. Yeah, and yeah. it's completely parallel to the bench. No, that's good. Good. There is something more. Look at the third cobbling. Look this groove. Yeah, yeah, it runs the whole way. All the way on the gallery, yeah. on both sides. Well, what was it used for? I think it was used to hold uh, another beam, yeah. a wooden beam, right. on which the trolley was sliding on. For the ancient Egyptians, wood was scarce and very precious. According to Jean-Pierre, they would have recovered the wooden beams when the pyramid was completed, which explains the chisel marks. You know, I've been here 50 times and I never noticed that. It goes the whole length. That's terrific. So it's another, it's another evidence that the thing was really used for a trolley sliding up and down, and that's the stabilizer. It's too much details. Okay. Understand? Yes. Too much details. A lot of details. There's another clue at the top of the gallery. Though this step has been cemented, it was originally chiseled in a V-shape, maybe to